This is the fourth course in the Programming for Robotics series. Today you had the opportunity to uh, go through your third exercise with your TAs. And I hope you had some fun uh, solving the exercises. The rest of the day will be as follows. Uh, I will present to you lecture four, that is the last part about ROS1. Then Edo will give you an introduction to the fourth exercise. And after that, there will be a introduction to ROS2, which is optional. You're invited and free to uh, come over to listen to the introduction to ROS2. Some administrative notes. Um, the evaluation will be a multiple choice test, and the test will count for 50% of your final grade. It will take about 40 minutes, and it will take place at the last course day. That is March 5th at 8 o'clock sharp at Hauptgebouwde E3. Then the exercise four grading session uh, had to be moved to Thursday at 8 o'clock. Today will be the, the fourth uh, course in the series, and I will introduce to you some concepts like uh, ROS service and actions. And then I will discuss the concepts of time and ROS bags. And finally, I will go into some debugging strategies. And after that, Edo will do the introduction to ROS2 concepts. Now, ROS services. ROS services are a great addition to the uh, tools that you have learned previously. Services allow you to do two-way communication between nodes. Specifically, it's a request-response communication. The service server advertises a service, and the service client accesses that service. More specifically, a service can be described by its service name, which uniquely identifies the service, and the service definition, which is stored in an SRV file and has a structure similar to that of messages. ROS provides you with the necessary command line tools to navigate the services that are available in your ROS network. You can use the ROS service list command to list all the available services. You can show the type of a specific service by calling the ROS service type command. And you can even actually call a service by call using the ROS service call command with the name of the service and the arguments to the uh, service call. Now, how do these SRV files look like? Here we see two examples of ROS service description files. These two can be found in the standard packages, standards services, and the package navigation messages. A SRV, or service description file, consists of two parts, a request part and a response part. They are separated by a triple dash. The request part to the left is empty. That means that there is no, that there are no parameters to the request. The response part to the left consists of a bool, a Boolean value indicating whether the service call was successful, and a string with a message that might indicate whatever happened. A good application for such a service call is, for example, a, a drone that has to um, to open its, its landing gear. You, as a service client, will uh, send a service request to the drone, indicating that it should make its landing gear available, and the drone will answer with some success and a, uh, and a message. To the right, we have a service definition with a request part and a response part. Now, this service definition is used to let a node uh, compute a, a path plan based on a starting position and a goal position to 
together with some parameter, which is a floating point uh, tolerance value. You could use this surface to request from a, compu a computing node a plan based on starting and goal positions. Let's go through a quick example. We will open a few terminals. In the first terminal, we will start the raw score by just typing raw score. Then we open a new window. And in that window, we will execute the ROS run command to start the add to ins server in the ROS CPP tutorials package. This package is a off the shelf package provided by ROS. Now in the third terminal, we'll be analyzing and calling the servers that we just started. First of all, the ROS service list command. When we execute the ROS service list command, we will see that the command returns all the services available at this moment in your ROS network. And one of these services is the service add to ins, like expected. We also see that there are some more services available. These are automatically instantiated by the ROS infrastructure. The second command that's useful is the ROS service type command. This will return the type or the service definition name of a specific service. If we execute this ROS service type command on the add to ins uh, service name, it will result in the ROS CPP tutorials to ins, which is the name of the service description. Now we would like to know what this service description actually looks like. And that is where the ROS SRV command comes in. ROS SRV show gives us a textual representation of the SRV file. And in this case, we see that there are a total of two request uh, parameters and one uh, response parameter. The two request parameters are A and B, which are both signed 64-bit wide integers. And the response value is also signed 64-bit integer called sum. That means that we can now call the service because we know what the request parameters should look like. And we can do that with the ROS service call command. The first parameter to ROS service call is the name of the service. And that's, in this case, add to ins. Then comes the description of the, requ the request parameters. Now, this might be a bit tedious for you to type. And that's, luckily, where autocompletion comes in. As soon as you've typed the name of the service, you should try to hit the tab key and let the autocompletion automatically fill in a stub for the request. And by default, the values of, in this case, A and B will be set to zero. And you can then edit these values um, like you want. In this case, I chose to set A to 10, B to 5. When we execute the ROS service call command, it will return a response from the ROS service server. In this case, that is the obvious value of 15. If we go back to the second terminal, we will now see that the add to in server even uh, output some information about what it received and what it sent back. And this corresponds naturally to the values that we supplied earlier. Now, this was a quick demonstration of what a service server actually does. But how does this look like in your C++ implementation in the ROS C++ client library? To the right is the source code of the add to ins server example. Now, I have to say that this is not using the object-oriented approach that we are um, requiring of you. But that is, that's just done for brevity here. Let's go through it step by step. The essential thing to do after initializing the ROS node and the node handle is to create a service variable. 
The service variable can be created by calling the advertise service uh, function on the node handle. The first parameter of the advertise service function is the name of the service. And then the callback, uh, the name of the, the name of the callback should be the second uh, argument to the advertise service function. Now this callback has two parameters. The first parameter is the request. When a service request is received, the callback function is called with the request as argument. We're then supposed to uh, use this request, uh, the request data that you just received in the callback to compute the response. Once you've computed the response, you're supposed to fill this data in the response object, which is the second argument to the callback. Note that the second argument, just like the first, is a reference. That means that if you set something in this variable, that it will be set in the caller as well. And finally, we're supposed to return true if the service call was successful. Note that there is a difference between a successful service call and the success of your application. For example, if you have a path planner and it is not able to compute a path because there is something blocking, then the service call might be successful, but the response might, be, um, might contain a Boolean success, which is set to false. Now, I just showed you how you can invoke the ROS service uh, from, a, from the command line by calling the ROS service call command. However, in most cases, you will want to call the, uh, any service from your ROS CPP program. So this is an example of a service client. The service client first initializes a service client variable by calling the service client function on the node handle. Note that in angle brackets is supposed to go the type of service. And in this case, that is the raw CPP tutorials, then, um, and then the two ints type. Next, we create a new instance of the two ints variable which we call service in this case, and we are supposed to fill the values of the request. In this case, we fill the values of requests by taking the uh, first and the second argument uh, to the command line after the program name, which are argv1 and argv2. Then we use the a2i function to convert this uh, string type to an integer value. And finally, we actually call the service with the client.call function. If that is successful, then the response will be filled with the response as given by the service server. In this case, that means that the sum uh, per parameter is set, and we output that value to the command line with the ROS uh, info logging function. Now, we can run that example. We can execute ROS run ROS CPP tutorials, add two ints client with the two, uh, two integers of our choice, and we get the result as expected. Now, ROS services are a great way to facilitate communication between two nodes in a one, uh, in a one short fashion. However, they are supposed to be used with relatively short processes and they are blocking. That means that the client waits until the server is ready. In practice, there will be many situations where you have time extended um, things that you want to do. And that is where ROS actions come in. ROS actions are similar to service calls, but they provide the possibility to cancel a task, which is called preemption, and also to receive feedback on the process progress of a uh, task. 
it is the best way to implement interfaces to time-extended, goal-oriented behavior. That means, for example, having a robot drive to a certain location or indicate a dishwashing machine to start washing dishes. The structure uh, of the goal, status, feedback, and result messages is defined in an actions file. Now, internally, actions are implemented with a set of topics. Um, so in theory, you could implement something comparable yourself by, um, by you can uh, implement something comparable yourself by writing it from scratch. But in this case, we advise you to use Ross Actions because it is a tried and tested way of implementing these time extended um, action calls. So more specifically, an action is described by the action definition file. And the action definition file consists of three components. This time there is a goal, a result, and a feedback part to the action. The syntax is, again, comparable to that of the messages and the service files. And this time, the different parts, the goal, the result, and feedback, are again separated by a triple dash. To the left, we find the averaging action. It's an averaging action that uh, takes as goal a number of samples that it should average. Then, as a result, it will show us the mean and the standard deviation. But while it is computing this, under the assumption that this is a very slow process, you might be interested in feedback. The feedback indicates what the current sample is that the uh, service that the, uh, that the the that the node is working on, the currently uh, computed mean and the currently computed standard deviation. The way we can follow the process of the uh, of the averaging action while it is happening. The other example is the follow path action where we indicate as a goal a path to be followed. The final result is success, whether the path was followed successfully or not. And the feedback indicates while the path is being followed, what the remaining distance is and what the initial distance is. Now, we have a few tools in our tool belt to work with ROS and communicate between nodes. Let's go through them step by step and discuss what the different types of uh, communication uh, allow you to do. The first type is the parameters, the parameter, um, the, the uh, parameter server. It allows you to set globally constant parameters. Um, it's best used for um, example, setting calibration parameters in robots for setting the camera settings, um, specifying the specific setup of the robot. Practically, all applications where the configuration data is constant over the runtime of the ROS network. Now, there's also the dynamic reconfigure type of um, data communication. We didn't go into the details of the dynamic reconfigure a type, but it's included here for, for the sake of completeness. Um, as opposed to the parameter type, it allows you to change the parameter of uh, during runtime. And this is a very useful uh, feature. However, it's not always trivial to implement this, since you will have to implement uh, callbacks that will respond to changes in your configuration. And in many cases, it is not uh, obvious to change the parameters while your robot is running. However, examples of where it might be interesting to use the dynamic reconfigure uh, type is to uh, tune parameters of your controller on runtime, or for example, set the white balance of a camera on runtime. 
Then we have learned about topics. So let's publish a subscriber. This is the, the type that you would typically use for continuous data streams. It's a one-way continuous data flow. So if you need to implement two-way communication with topics, you will need two topics. Typical applications are sensor data, robot state, uh, camera streams, laser scans, for example. Then there are services, which we learned of today, which are non-continuous uh, calls to uh, a service server. It's a blocking call. The service client requests a service server to compute something, and the server computes it and returns only when it's done. The application is typically uh, short triggers of calculations. So, for example, indicating a, a lawnmower that it should go into emergency uh, mode, for example, um, or a dishwasher to, to stop doing the dishes. And finally, there's actions. So actions is the, the time extended counterpart of services. It's non-blocking, the goals are preemptible. It's typically used for long-running robot tasks like uh, robots navigating to different places, doing long time extended uh, computations even, uh, navigation, grasping motions. Now there's the concept of ROS time. Normally, ROS uses the PC system clock as the time source, and they call that wall time. It's because they refer to the, the clock at the wall. For simulations of playback or log data, it is convenient to work with a simulated time, however, because you can then pause the time or you can slow down the execution of the network. To work with a simulated clock, you have to set the use same time parameter to true. And we can use the ROS param set command to do this. The time will then be published on the clock topic. When you start Gazebo, it will be uh, enabled by default because this is under the assumption that you are doing some simulation. And when you are working with ROS bags, which we will learn of uh, shortly, it, then it's only enabled when you supply the option minus minus clock. To take the advantage of simulated time, you should use the ROS time APIs. So you should not use the C++, for example, the C++ chrono APIs or the, the system calls that provide you with time. Instead, you should use the ROS time APIs because ROS can then control what the value will be that it returns to your program. And in this example, um, uh, we initialize a variable with the name begin of the type ROS time by calling the ROS time now static function. We can get the number of seconds uh, by calling the two sec on this variable. The time is a time point. Complementary, there is a duration. A duration is a difference in time points. Uh, in the first example, we just create a duration from scratch. And the first uh, parameter to the duration constructor is the value 0 0.5, which indicates that this duration should be 0 0.5 seconds. Now, what's interesting is that we can also calculate a duration by taking two time points. And in this case, I take the current time and I subtract the time at the start of the program that will give me the duration that it took for the program to go from the current time to, uh, from the starting time to the current uh, position in code. And then there's the ROS uh, rate type, which we have seen previously, which allows us to set some kind of frequency for our program. Now, if you really need wall time for uh, specific calculations uh, or algorithms that should be independent of simulated time, then you should use the ROS wall time equivalents. 
So in this case, that's the rolls wool time, rolls wool duration, and rolls wool rate. Those will not be affected by slowdowns or simulation time. An extremely useful tool in ROS is the ROS bag. The ROS bag is a kind of logging mechanism that allows you to store messages that are transported on the ROS network. It is a binary format with the extension .bag. It's suited for logging and recording data sets for later visualization and analysis purposes. It's intended to be fast, so it should be able to record even uh, networks with a lot of data being communicated. The ROS provides the necessary command line tools to work with ROS bags. One of the most important commands is the ROS bag record command. In this case, the first example, we indicate that we want to record all the topic, topics in the network which is typically a nice way to get started with recording ROS bags. Alternatively, we can indicate which topics we exactly want to record. Um, and the parameters are just the topic names that we want to record. If we are done recording, we use the control C keys to stop recording. And then the bag is saved with the start date and the time in the current folder. Now, Recording all the topics at the same time might be a very convenient thing to do, but it does uh, pose the risk of um, storing extremely an extreme amount of data. And this will this might not be what you want. So it's a good way to get started, but once you know which topics you actually want, it's preferable to just specify these topics uh, explicitly. Once you've recorded a ROS bag, you can use other command line tools to get more information about the bag. The ROS bag info command will give you information about the size, the length, the time, the topics available. Then the ROS bag play command will allow you to actually play back a bag on the network. So that means that everything that was recorded is replayed again and will be shown on the network once again. This can be very useful because you can record the sensor data then that the robot, for example, retrieved initially, and you can replay it again, and you can have the robot um, re-execute what it was doing um, physically in simulation. So you do some experiments, some trials, you record all the sensor input, then you take that ROS bag to the lab and you will, in simulation, then tune and optimize your algorithms, develop new ones. Then you can, when you're done tuning your algorithms and your parameters and creating new nodes, you can take your robots out again, do some experiments, record a new ROS bag, and use that again to iterate over your robot development. The Rosberg play command takes some more uh, parameters like the rate, which would allow you to slow down the, uh, the execution of the uh, ROS bag. And this is why you need to use the ROS time API, because if you would not use that, then your program has no way of knowing that its time should be slowed down. There is the, the clock parameter, which we mentioned briefly, um, which would publish the simulation time. And there's finally the loop, um, the loop flag, which will uh, restart playing once the ROS bag is finished, which might be interesting if you have a continuous stream of, of data in which you want to keep operating. Now let's discuss some debugging strategies. We've learned a lot of tools and um, when we are working with all these tools, we might run into different problems. And debugging strategies are nice guidelines to help you uh, smoothen out your development. So let's first go through the tools that we have learned. 
One thing to do is to compile and run your code often to catch bugs early. When you compile and you have a working version, then you change a few lines of code and you recompile and you run into an error. Then the source of the error is quite easily located. It's most likely the lines of code that you just edited. However, when you are writing code for hours on end and you run into some compilation issues which you don't solve, and finally you want to get your program working, then it might be very ambiguous where the uh, actual errors are. So the advice is to compile and run code often to catch bugs early. Now, another tip that's maybe easier said than done is to understand the compilation and runtime error messages. Now, the compilation will often provide you with a long list of text, but if you read it very precisely, uh, it will contain a lot of useful information on where the problem was found, what the compiler found troublesome, and how you might uh, even resolve the issue. Now, this, this requires some getting used to. The first few times that you go through it, it is very confusing. But once you know where to look, it will be easier and easier. Also, runtime error messages uh, might provide you with hints where you can um, where you should improve or fix your code. Then we should use analysis tools to check whether the data is flowing as expected. Um, when you are publishing topics and subscribing to topics and something is not working out, you are not receiving topics, for example, you can use the rosnode info command to check what the actual topic names are that your node is publishing or subscribing to. And if there's any mistake there in the names, then that might be an obvious source of uh, problems. Cross topic echo allows you to actually show what is being produced on the, um, on the topic. Um, say that something is not working, say that you, your robot is not moving. Well, let's check the ROS topic echo on the uh, velocity command. And if it stays zero, then that might be a pointer to the problem. There is the tool ROS WTF, which tries to analyze your ROS network and hint about problems that are in the configuration of your nodes or your host name or your network. This might be a very useful tool when you're out of ideas of what is going on. There is RQT Graph, which is the tool that will show you the interconnections between the different nodes in the ROS network. That means you will see the nodes, you will see the topic names, and you will see arrows that indicate the flow of data between these nodes and topics. When you are running into problems that some node is not receiving data, you can easily check RQT graph and check if the relation is there, if the path between a node, a topic, and another node is present. And if not, that again gives you pointers where to look for the error. Now, these textual command line tools give you, uh, might give you a lot of help. Often when you are working with, um, with, uh, visual data, with data that is, that's better visualized, you should use uh, RVIS or RQT Multiplot to debug uh, your, your problem. For example, if something in a control algorithm is going wrong, you might want to visualize the input and the output of the uh, control algorithm. And RVs and RQ2 multiplots are very useful uh, for that. It's always wise to divide your program into small steps and check intermediate results with uh, the logging functions that we've learned. You might it might be it might be easy to just take a function and extend it over time and add some more features and uh, get like one big bulk of a function, but then it's very hard to debug that. It's instead it's better to split up your uh, the functionality in your code in different responsibilities and use these smaller functions 
and combine these smaller functions and even test these smaller functions to make your code easier to maintain and more reliable. Once you are um, simplifying these functions and splitting a big bulky function up into smaller parts, you might want to make your code more robust um, by checking the return values, checking the argument values, and if any error occurs, um, so checking the values, whether they are as expected, and uh, throwing an exception uh, if there is an error in the argument, or uh, catching exceptions when you are calling some function that might throw them, and handle them appropriately. You should extend and optimize your code only once a basic version works. It might be um, it might be uh, nice to implement some optimization that will give you a little bit of an edge, a performance edge over your over the naive uh, version of your code. But this typically adds up to the complexity. And then once you try to get your program working, there are many potential points of failure. So it might be better to just get a basic version working first, and from that point on, try to improve the performance by applying performance optimizations. Now, and if things all don't make sense, then that might be an indication that you should clean your workspace. The build system, Catkin, uh, incrementally builds your workspace. And it tries to analyze what you changed since last time, and then uh, compile only the things that change. But this process sometimes a bit problematic. And then internally, when Catkin loses track, it might mess up the output of your program. In that case, you run Catkin clean minus minus all to get rid of your workspace, and you rebuild it again. Let's quickly discuss some new tools, which we haven't uh, discussed in detail in this course, but are great um, pointers to uh, where you might improve your programming and ROS um, skills. So what you might want to do is to build your program in debug mode and then use a debugger like KDB or a uh, runtime analysis tool like Valgrind to check what is going on in your tool. These debugging tools allow you to step through your code to catch bugs. Now, to set the debug, to set indicate Catskin that it should build your program in debug mode, you pass the D CMake build type debug uh, flag to your Catkin config. To indicate Catkin that it should build in release, you should send, you should submit the release flag instead. Now the default is debug anyway. But at a given point, when you when the complexity of your nodes increases, you will typically find yourself building in release mode because it gives a significant performance benefit. However, when you are trying to debug that code, then the release build will be very scrambled and optimized and very hard to, uh, to analyze. You will indicate, uh, you have to indicate Catkin to build in debug mode to keep all debug symbols, to keep uh, to run code in the order that you uh, that you wrote it, etc. So as I mentioned, you can use debugger breakpoints, for example, in Eclipse. Um, this is a little bit of effort to set up, but once you have that working, it is a very useful tool. You can, for example, say um, pause the code execution once you hit this line, and once you actually hit that line you will get an overview of the current state of all the variables at that point in your code. So you can even change the value of a variable in your code at runtime. Another great thing to do is to write unit tests and integration tests to discover regressions or bugs. Regressions are um, bugs that occur because you change some part of the code and then another part collapses. So unit tests and integration tests help you to discover these regressions and other bugs. In more detail, uh, unit tests, integration tests, and automatic testing 
provide a great way to improve the maintainability of your code. It's a investment in the quality because it will take some time to set up and to get right. However, the idea is that on the long term, it will save you a lot of hassle and uh, improve the quality of your code. A unit test is a test that feeds a known input to an algorithm and then expects a known output. So once you have a controller that should behave in a certain way, you can write a unit test that feeds it a known sequence of values, then retrieves the uh, computed sequence of values from the controller or from the algorithm, and then checks whether uh, these values uh, match. And if that's not the case, then that might indicate that um, your algorithm is failing somehow. So what you're actually doing there is you are testing the interface of your code. It forces you to reason about the contract of the code. And that's actually uh, something that's very useful when developing software, because you're now um, looking at your code from the perspective of the one that's using it instead of the one that's writing it. This is a simple graphic that indicates what the unit test actually does. It's like a wrapper around a specific algorithm. So we have a mapping algorithm and a control algorithm here. And the unit test is actually uh, a wrapper around these algorithms that uh, gives a known input to the mapping algorithm and then checks the known uh, output of the algorithm. Now, those were unit tests. We also have integration tests. And as the name suggests, those tests um, check how you, uh, whether the program, the integrated program, behaves as expected. So instead of a, um, a separate part of algorithm, the integration tests test the behavior of your program with all the different parts interconnected. Automatic tests in general reduce the risk of bugs and regressions. So um, these are great tools to help you streamline your work, especially when you are working with more people on a single project. You would want some automated way to test if a change in some part of the code doesn't break other parts of the code. Now, this concludes the theoretical part about uh, ROS1 in the ROS course. Uh, might you, at some point, uh, want to set up a development PC, a native PC that runs ROS, then uh, we would like to, we would invite you to read the uh, setting up a native developer's PC uh, document provided on the, on the website. Finally, there are the typical further references, which uh, are great resources to extend your knowledge about uh, ROS1 and ROS1 programming. And that concludes the ROS1 part of the course. Now, Edo will provide you with uh, an introduction to the exercise first. And when that's done, um, we, he will introduce you to the concept of ROS2. Thank you for your attention and hope to see you soon. Thank you, Tom. Um, so we will have now the exercise session introduction. Uh, and then what you can do is you can all, if you're not interested in ROS2, you can start already solving the exercise. And then the TAs should be with you uh, after the lecture finish, which will be in roughly half an hour. Um, and then I guess I will share my screen now. Okay. Tom, do you see my terminal now? Yes, I see the terminal in your virtual machine. Good, great.
Uh, so then let's quickly have a look together at the exercise four. So here you will be working with Rosbax um, and RQT multiplot. Rosbax Tom has introduced in this lecture and RQT multiplot we've already seen in the previous lecture. So what you have to do is you have to download one Rosbach, which is here on the course website. And it just contains uh, data that has been recorded uh, on the real robot. And what you will do during the exercise, essentially you will play this Rosbach and you will observe what the robot uh, was doing. So here we have, you have to look a bit into what this EKF localization node is doing, which I will quickly guide you through. And then you have to use the RQT multiplot. Um, in case you don't remember how to do this, you can check uh, lecture three. We plotted some example data there. Um, and then finally, you should write one launch file, uh, which will start this EKF localization node, and you have to properly configure it. Uh, but you can use the same configuration files as we used for simulation. And these you can find if you type in uh, this command here. Um, you have to play the ROS pack, and you have to then visualize uh, pretty much everything in Arvis. Uh, there are also some bonus tasks here, uh, which I will not, um, I will not give an intro to them. Uh, however, if you just very quickly Google, uh, you will find that they're uh, easy to solve. Uh, note that so here all the functionality must be implemented inside a class. So for this exercise, you actually don't need to modify any C++ code. Uh, so you should not get uh, scared by this note here. It's just from the previous exercise. Uh, and then for this exercise, we also try to spread the points out a bit more such that um, you can basically to increase the granularity and then you can get a bit, it's easier to get more points. And it also should make sure that uh, grading is a bit more consistent uh, across different groups. Okay, so now what we can do is we can just quickly, I'll just open up my workspace. And I will source it. Uh, okay. And then what we can do now. So if you just launch your simulation, let's say just a kind of bare bones simulation. So hopefully now this starts. Okay. And so now if you want to look a bit uh, which nodes are here, so you can see that there's here this EKF localization node, and then you can just quickly look at what is it doing. Uh, if you just basically look at ROS node info, uh, you can see you can see which topics is it subscribing to. And you can essentially see that it has same two topics as you will have in the ROS pack, which is this IMU data and odometry. And you can also see then what it publishes. Uh, so basically you can see that it filters the odometry, it fuses the IMU and the wheel odometry, and then it publishes this uh, to TF. Uh, you can also see between which frames the transformation is published if you just use 
the TF tools um, that we introduced in the previous lecture. And so now I believe um, then one of the tasks is uh, to download the back. So I will now show, show you how to play the ROS back. Uh, and you should also remember when you play the ROS back to set this use simulated time to true and to play the ROS back with dash dash clock argument, uh, just to ensure that you use the simulated time and that the ROS back publishes uh, time as it was gathered by sensors. Otherwise you might get, uh, if you're getting weird results, these are first two things uh, that you can check. Uh, also, uh, one thing you have to configure this EKF localization node, and this you can simply find this. You can find the configuration file if you just do ROS CD SMB control. Uh, and if you go into config, so here you can see there's a bunch of different configuration files but you are interested in the localization one, which I'm just quickly here previewing. Uh, so what this file does, it just tells the EKF localization node, which is basically a Kalman filter. Uh, it sets some parameters and it tells which states kind of to use uh, for estimating the robot state. It also sets in general, this node also works for 3D, uh, in full 3D. However, since we just have a mobile base, we use it here in uh, 2D mode. And here you should not, you probably don't have to change anything. You can just uh, either copy paste or you can use the same uh, localization uh, parameter, same localization argument. Uh, okay. And now, so what you can do is I have already written ROS launch. So I have localization EKF. Okay, so I have basically made a new package, uh, which is called SMB localization. And there, from this package, I'm launching my node. Um, but you don't have to do this. You can also just modify your old SMB high-level controller. I will show you this. Um, so if you start, if you start uh, the EKF node, so right now nothing happens and model has not been spawned since we're not running the simulation and I'm not getting any output in the RVs yet. So what I can do is I will now play my ROSBAG node, which is here in the source folder. So I should do ROSBAG play and then just name of the node and important option, this dash dash clock. Uh, one important thing is that you can pause playing just if you hit space button. So now I can play pause and this is convenient if you wanna now maybe open up RQT multiplot. And so now you should see basically uh, that from the ROS back, now the EKF node and the whole robot publisher are estimating state of the robot. And you can see uh, how this is being played back in the RVIS. So you can see now that the robot is moving around. You will see these wheels that are lagging a bit behind the robot, um, which is, simply I believe because the rate of the joint angle messages is not too high. However, you should not uh, worry about this. Like we, you won't lose any points. This is normal if it happens. And now you can just run the RQT multiplot. RQT multiplot. Okay. And so here I have already saved a configuration um, for the RQT multiplot, and you can see that it's being loaded. Uh, so this file basically contains my configuration. 
but you can also you, you you will have to create this from scratch and you can just refer to the lecture free uh, video recording to see how it's done. So here we have uh, X coordinate on the X axis, Y coordinate on the Y axis. And now if I hit play, nothing happens yet. Um, but if I now play my ROS bag, I can see that now path of the robot is kind of being plotted on the fly. So as the robot moves, um, you can see that this is being uh, updated. Okay. Um, so there are a few other points where you have to visualize the laser data from Velodyne LiDAR. Um, so this is what you see, these weird dots and lines. This is the laser data. And here we're using the full uh, 3D LiDAR that was recorded on the robot. Um, so you will have to visualize this and maybe change a bit the size and the color transformer. And then you should also notice, um, so we, we ask you to add one more frame here uh, that should hover above the robot, which is this frame here, SMB top view. And this frame should move with the robot. So as the robot drives around, this drives around with the robot. And the simplest way to do this is um, just as outlined here in the exercise, you should just use a static TF publisher. Uh, okay. Uh, one more point. So I believe we ask you to make two plots with RQT multiplot. So I just showed you how to make uh, how to make a plot for the simulated robot uh, for the sorry recorded robot. But you can also you also have to do this for the simulated robot, and you don't have to do this for a robot from the previous exercise. You can also just run run the simulation and move the robot around uh, with the teleop node. So in the exercises, as an example, I have put here the XY plot of SMB driving into the pillar, but you don't have to do this. You can also just drive it around with, uh, with the teleop node. And then, so in terms of file structure, um, so here I have made like one extra package for this, uh, where then I put my EKF localization launch file and the config file, and also the RVIS file for visualization. But you don't really have to do that. You can also just put your launch file um, in the solution, either from previous exercise or from the exercise two. And I think this covers all the points. Yes, so this would be then the end of the exercise introduction. Are there any questions regarding the exercise? Okay, there don't seem to be. So then since lecture today is a bit longer, we will have five minute break now, such that you can go grab some coffee, tea, use the bathroom. Uh, and then we will start with ROS2 at 10.20. So I will see you all in five minutes.
Okay, so now we will start uh, with ROS2 part. Um, can you see my screen? Can you hear me well? Yes. Good, thank you. Okay, so this will be like a very brief introduction um, and we will mainly point you to the resources that are out there for learning uh, about ROS2 yourself. You will find that once you know ROS1, uh, it's not too difficult to learn ROS2 simply because the people who have written ROS2 have made sure that core concepts um, stay the same. And what has changed essentially is mainly um, the implementation under the hood of how messages and data is uh, moved around different, moved around your computer and how it's sent to different processes. Um, some of you, I believe, has asked us why teaching ROS1 and why not ROS2. Uh, simply, this is because there's still a lot of ROS1 code out there. And if you start your semester project or your master thesis in one of the uh, robotics labs at ETH, you will find that we all still use uh, ROS1. So ROS2 distribution that we used with, uh, with Ubuntu 2004 is this Foxy Fitzroy. And today we'll just talk about what's the philosophy behind ROS2, what are the differences to ROS1, we will have, we will look at some command line tools um, that we can use same as in ROS1 to quickly debug things, find out information and analyze stuff. We will look at launch files, which are quite different in ROS2 than in ROS1. And then we will look at ROS bridge, which is something that enables, enables the communication between uh, ROS1 and ROS2. So you can have, both types running uh, on the same PC. Um, so why do we even need ROS2 and what's wrong with ROS1? Uh, simply because initially ROS1 was just designed uh, for one robot and this was the PR2 um, back in 2007 uh, and it was it was never really designed to be used uh, for real-time applications. So you have quite a bit of overhead um, in when communicating between different processes, which just has to do of how uh, this communication is implemented. Um, today, people also want to use it for real-time mission critical stuff, for if you have your system, maybe like an autonomous driving car, um, there it's pretty important that you can react quickly and that there's no, uh, no additional delays introduced uh, from your communication. ROS1 was also mainly designed for research, uh, which means I think at Stanford when they designed it, the goal was just kind of to be able to quickly reproduce results on the PR2 robot. And then what happened is that people also started using it for different robots. And now you have quite a bit of different robots that still use um, ROS1. Um, but the problem is for research, we usually don't care about certifications and we care less about uh, safety than industry. And then the industry also wants to have this working really robustly, reliably, get a certification and then be able uh, to sell it, which with ROS1 uh, was very hard to do. So these are some of the kind of new, new use cases um, that ROS1 was not really designed for. Uh, so for example, if you have teams of robots, which uh, with ROS1, it's a bit cumbersome to do because you always need to have this ROS master running. And then there are, quite, there are some different hacks that you can do to have multiple masters running. But when the system was designed, this use case was just not foreseen. And everybody was kind of uh, envisioning that you would have this ROS master running and everything on one robot. Um, it is also not very well suited for just kind of microcontrollers and embedded um, platforms. 
simply because it's rather heavy uh, in terms of com com computation resources. And as I mentioned, uh, the communication in ROS1 is really non-real time, which is something that is being addressed now in ROS2. Also, ROS1 was always, um, when designed, people had in mind that you will always kind of run it on a good network with ethernet and that the communication will be reliable, um, which for some applications can be less and less the case. If you think about maybe underwater robotics, or if you think about uh, maybe some teleoperation where you rely on 4G and then depending on how many people in your area uh, watch YouTube videos, you will have um, quite a bit of different throughput uh, through such a network. There is also, as I mentioned, now people want to use it in industry and not only in research. And certain things in ROS1, as the authors have admitted themselves, were not designed the best way. It was just a decision that was made back in 2007. And then they realized it was not the best. So in ROS2, some of the API will be redesigned, which for you, this means that if you have your ROS1 code <clears throat> working, there will be some effort um, and some overhead to port it to ROS2. It will not work out of the box. Um, so some of the core differences is that, uh, so ROS1 also supports other operating systems. Uh, whereas, oh, sorry, ROS2 supports other operating systems, whereas ROS1 was only working on Linux. With ROS2, you can have also the Mac operating system and Windows. ROS2 has entirely switched to C11 at least and Python 3. Whereas before ROS1 Ros Noetic, you would have C standard 03 and Python 2. And this C11 is especially convenient because it allows you to use some of the newer features uh, for memory management, which then basically facilitate your C++ programming and you get less seg faults uh, and like less crashes that could maybe result from poor memory management. Um, another core difference is that ROS2 uses off-the-shelf middleware. Um, and middleware is just simply these communication mechanisms. For example, if we have two processes and then they need to talk to each other and you want to send a message, you need to first uh, marshal this message, then send it over the network, and then the other process has to reconstruct it. So in the background, there's, there's a program running and doing all of this, and this is what is referred uh, as middleware. So for ROS1, um, these programs for doing the communication were entirely implemented uh, by ROS1 maintainers, which basically meant that they had a lot of code to maintain and they would not profit then um, from whatever the industry was using. Whereas meanwhile, um, quite a bit of different people and companies have implemented their own middlewares, which are better than what was in ROS1. So now in ROS2, you can basically choose which software do you use uh, for you to run in the background and do all the, all the communication. Um, so you can now just plug in, you implement an interface and you can use this uh, and you can tell ROS2 to use uh, this middleware from a different vendor. There's also a bit tighter Python integration. Uh, for example, in ROS2, launch files are written in Python, which basically means that you can have uh, finer, finer control over conditional statements in your launch files. Uh, whereas before, if you wanted to do kind of anything with if, or if you wanted to implement a switch statement in your launch file, this would get um, quite a bit more complicated. And it would just introduce a lot of variables and a lot of extra code. Whereas uh, 
In Rust 2, you can just use Python, which then handles this much more gracefully than the XML. Um, we also can have real-time notes in ROS2, uh, where real-time just means that you guarantee that the node will execute in, I don't know, 100 milliseconds. Whereas with ROS1, depending on what was happening on the network, what was happening in the background with communication, this time could basically grow infinitely long. Uh, this you usually don't see in practice, but uh, for industry, these things are very important. And so as, as we mentioned, there's ROS2 is mainly about technical changes under the hood, whereas uh, main concepts like ROS node, topics, uh, and all the other tools that you've learned so far uh, will mostly remain the same. Um, so yes, so we have like graph concepts, which is same as in ROS1, where you have these nodes that are then interconnected uh, through a bunch of topics, and they also publish then streams of messages. Uh, we also have nodes, which are exactly the same as in ROS1. Um, it's just like a unit that is individually compiled and then if we're talking about C++, and then that performs one function. For example, this could be a node that reads data um, from a sensor. We have two client libraries, uh, or RCLs in ROS2. So there's RCL CPP, and there's RCL Py for Python. Um, in this course, so in this intro, we will mainly be working with the CPP one, uh, although we will not be writing much code, so it, it doesn't really matter. And then there's also the discovery, which happens then again, as in ROS1. Um, so you just kind of publish your message and the other node subscribes to this topic. And then under the hood, somewhere in the background, um, someone actually figures out that these two nodes can talk to each other and then routes the message correctly uh, to the receiver. Um, so the, co conceptually, it is still the same. Uh, it just differently implemented in ROS2. Uh, one difference in ROS2 is that nodes will only establish connections if they have a compatible quality of service setting, which is just a parameter that you can defy is like, what bandwidth do you expect uh, from, this, from this message stream? And it's especially useful if you have to work with some lossy networks, like uh, maybe underwater robotics or some teleoperation. So here, uh, we will run a few, few examples. Uh, so maybe I will just now go to the split screen mode. Okay, so here I've just set up a virtual machine uh, with Ubuntu 20.04 uh, and ROS2. Uh, just this is why it's not working. Just a second. No. Okay, I guess you can see reasonably well. Uh, so what we will do is we will just run, same as we did for ROS1, we will run this uh, talker listener node, which in ROS2, if you want to run a node, what you do is you do ROS2 uh, and then run. And then again, similar is in ROS1, you would say package name, which in this case would be demo nodes CPP. You can also use tab to autocomplete the name of the package. And then here, if you click tab, if you press tab, you should see list of all the nodes available. So we're just gonna run uh, talker. So this is very similar before you would just have ROS run, 
but now these commands are kind of split into first you say hey I want to use ROS2 and then the second word just tells you uh, what the which command do you want and then again we look at um, demo nodes uh, for example we can also use python and we can put here listener so now again we see uh, same as in ros1 that this talker is publishing this hello world message which then uh, this listener guy is receiving and just printing out here um, on the screen and if we open now another terminal uh, you can see that most of the tools for analysis uh, are pretty much the same as in ROS1. So I just quickly need to source my workspace. Hopefully without typos. Okay. So now if I wanna maybe see which nodes are active, you can just say ROS instead of ROS node list, Again, this command is just split into ROS2. Uh, tell the system that I want to use ROS2, and then you say node, and then this will just list me everything that it's out there. And then if you want to find out maybe more info about the node, you can just say ROS2 node info, I don't know, talker. Uh, and then it tells me a bunch of different stuff uh, like what is what is the uh, type of the of the message that it's publishing? What are the topics? Does it have any services? Uh, and it tells me also a bunch of other things that maybe like what are the parameters? Are there any actions, um, etc. You can also look. Uh, you can also do same for topics. If you say ROS two topic and then you say list it tells you which topics are active uh, and then i think we can also echo uh, so, ah, ros2 topic echo ros2 topic echo chapter and now we should see so this is same as in ros1 we just see the string that it's being published then also you can basically inspect uh oops ross2 topic uh and let's say how fast is it being published and so it tells me that it's roughly at one hertz okay so we will now kill all of these nodes. Um, so I guess the main takeaway here is that instead of ROS, ROS run, instead of one command, the kind of keyword is split into two, where you type ROS2 at the beginning, and then the name of the command, uh, what you want to do. And so now maybe if you, if you looked at this small demo carefully, you might ask yourself, so where is now the ROS master? Because if you remember in ROS1, we would first run this ROS score, which would start the ROS master, and then you could do anything that you wanted uh, with your nodes around. And the answer is that there is no ROS master um, in ROS2. So in ROS2, this has been replaced by this data distribution service, uh, DDS, which is just like a distributed service that in the background does all of that plumbing uh, that we talked about uh, in ROS1 course in the first lecture. So this is this like marshalling uh, and transport in the background. So this shows you that basically ROS2 uh, has really been designed with kind of multi, multi-master or multi-robot use case in mind, whereas in ROS1, you would always have this master follower architecture, which means like sure the nodes were the nodes were communicating to each other as peer-to-peer. -peer. However, in the background, you would need to have like one central piece 
which was keeping basically track of all of this uh, communication. Uh, this is no longer the case in ROS2, and you don't need to have the ROS master running. Uh, there are also some changes uh, to ROS2 messages. So if you remember in ROS1, you would define this .msg and uh, .srv files, uh, which would then get, you would compile your package and this would generate then data structures that you could use um, in your programs. And you would also put them inside your CMake lists, which then when you compile your package, this code would get generated. So in ROS2, the concept stays the same. Um, it's just the syntax for generating message is a bit different. Uh, so on top of this MSG and SRV files, um, um, once you compile, you, once you compile your package, the data structures, so like the C++ data structures will be generated and also this IDL files, which are just some format that basically this DDS service understands um, and works with. So you also have access to these, but you don't have to use them. And then in your CMake lists, again, you have to define everything in CMake lists. It just, the structure is now a bit different. So you will need basically this package here, and then you will call this macro, which will tell then the compiler to generate a message, which is called, uh, just num.msg and to generate this service, which adds free integers. So this is, uh, this is the same thing, just briefly illustrated where you have from msg files, you create these message classes and this you can use in your client code, which is what we did uh, in ROS1. And then in ROS2, on top of this, these kind of IDL files are generated, which then the DDS uh, or the service works with. It knows how to send them, receive them. Um, and then if you want, you also have access to all of this generated code so you can work um, directly with them. Same as in ROS1, there's also a notion of workspace. Um, so you kind of have a current context that you are working with. And then again, you just do this by sourcing the right script, which again, as in ROS1, it's located in this opt, rock, opt ROS, and then you have the right distribution, which for our case, it's now this Foxy Fitzroy. Uh, if you were to source ROS1 here, instead of Foxy, you would simply put noetic or melodic uh, or whatever. You can also overlay uh, multiple of these workspaces, which is um, same as ROS1. And you can also have both ROS1 and ROS2 uh, distribution installed and overlaid, which is what we will see when we try to run um, the ROS1 bridge. Um, so how do we now build pack packages in ROS2? Uh, you can simply just, uh, there is no more catkin build. This tool has been replaced. And what has been migrated to is just this Colcon uh, build to, where Colcon is just kind of like a Python package that is meant, that is used for building and deploying a bunch of different software. So you have to install this just using opt-get, and then we will try, I will show you later how to compile one package. So here we can just simply clone it from GitHub, which is the same as in ROS1, because Git is independent from ROS. And then again, you have your workspace, which is, um, which is simply same as in ROS1, this structure of source folder, and then the build, and devil and lock folder are generated. Uh, and then again, once you're done building, you can just do source install setup. And in ROS2, we also have uh, the local setup. 
so the main difference is that uh, if you source your setup.bash, this sources your current workspace and also the underlying workspace, which for example, can just be the system install of ROS, which is this like opt ROS foxy uh, setup.bash. And then if you install only the local setup, it will not source um, the underlying workspace. It will really source only just the thing that you that you built. Uh, so we can maybe quickly try to see how all of these things look like. So here I just created one very simple workspace, which is this dev workspace and then so i have already built some works some packages here but you can see that if i maximize this that's a bit better okay so you can see again that there's same structure here we have the source folder which is again where you would put your code so here are just some like packages uh, that we created here for, for the course. And then once you invoke the build command, it will generate the build, install, and the log folder uh, for you. You can notice that there's no devil folder in Rust2. So instead of devil, you just use install where all of these um, sourcing scripts uh, are located together with your binaries and together with your um, executables and header files. Uh, there's also catkin clean. Uh, this no longer exists. So with Colcon, uh, with Colcon build, if you want to remove something, you can just do RM and you can just simply delete the install folder or, uh, or build folder uh, or both. So maybe I can do this now. I will just delete the whole install folder and log and build. So now everything is clean. And then when you build stuff, you always have to be in this top folder, uh, basically where your source for folder is. And so now if I just say Colcon build, this should build now all the packages that are in my workspace. According to the documentation, the main reason for switching to this Colcon build is simply that it's more flexible um, than Catkin build. Where Catkin build was always tied to CMake lists, this can also use um, other build systems, and apparently it's better, um, it's easier to work with unit tests and testing in general, which, as Tom mentioned in the last lecture, is something that you want to do anyway. So now, once this building is done, I can just source my workspace, which I do again source install. And we will just do setup.bash. And now I can basically run some of the nodes um, for one of these packages that I built here. So I can do ROS2 run. And then I can say test package and maybe run the test node, which is just this kind of hello, it's just a hello, simple hello world program. So this is somewhat different than in ROS1, but it's not too bad. Uh, in ROS2, you can also create packages, same as you could do with Catkin build system in ROS1. You can just create ROS2 package create. And then if you want to create empty package, um, you just don't give any arguments. Here you can specify what kind of build, build do you want. Uh, you can use CMake or this amend CMake and there's other options. So the reason I used amend CMake simply because this was in the tutorials, but it's 
same as CMake, just with some support for tests, uh, for extra testing. And then you can also tell ROS2 when you create a package, it can even create a node for you. So you can just say node name, and then you type name of your node and name of your package, and then it will generate just kind of this empty uh, hello world style node, which I can show you here. Um, so here, if we go in the source folder, this test package, this was created uh, with this ROS package create command. And then you can see, which one is it? So you can see it just generates kind of main, main function with some hello world uh, print message. Uh, okay, you can also uh, create a package and list all the dependencies uh, where you then say package name and then you add this arg argument depths. And then here you can say which dependencies you need. And then what this will do, it will basically generate CMake lists for you. And then it will add, for example, here. <clears throat> so this test package two uh, was created with this. Uh, it was created to have a dependency on demo nodes. And you can see that ROS2 added this line here in the CMake, where basically tells me, hey, find this package. Uh, and it's, it's a required dependency. So how do we launch multiple nodes in ROS2? Uh, as I mentioned, there's no more XML launch files. Everything's written in Python. And then you can do, again, ROS2 launch package name and launch file name. So what is important is that if you're writing a C++ package, you also need to ensure that these launch files uh, get copied over into this install folder. Uh, basically where you source your workspace from. And you can see, you can do this just by adding this snippet of code here, install uh, into your CMake lists. So if we look here, you can see, so I had to manually add this, but basically this snippet lines 34 through 38, this tells the CMake lists to copy everything that is in this launch file, in this launch folder into this, uh, so it copies it oops, into this install and then slash share folder where then all the, uh, all the launch files are stored. This is important. Um, so if you change your launch files, it is important to rerun then the Colcon build such that your launch files uh, get copied over uh, into this install folder when then they're run from when you type ROS2 launch. There is also an option to set um, such that this happens automatically, um, but it was a little bit more involved, so I didn't do it uh, for this tutorial. So now we can quickly try to run uh, one launch file here. So basically here, this test package two, uh, it just launches, uh, if you look at the source code here, so this is now a Python launch file. And what each of these Python launch files needs to have is this generate launch description function, which then, um, which then basically passes all the necessary arguments and nodes uh, to the ROS2 launch system. So if you look, uh, the syntax is a bit different and you basically generate this node object here. Uh, but if you look at the arguments that we're passing in here, they're pretty much the same um, as, as we did in ROS1. So you can see here, we set the namespace, then we say, okay, which package is our node from? And then we say, which executable? So this would have been this argument type in ROS1. And we say where to output um, this stuff. 
And then again, so we're launching one node, which is listener from this demo node CPP, which is what we ran earlier. And then we are also launching the talker, uh, talker node from the same package. So if you now try to run this, you should say ROS2 launch. Uh, and then we should type the name of the package which I believe was test package two, uh, and then name of the launch file, talker listener dot pi. Okay, so now you can see that this launch file just started both, uh, both the talker and the listener in the same terminal. And then now they're all just, uh, pinging each other where talker is publishing something and listener is printing out. So these are the exact same nodes that we ran earlier. Just one was in one console and the other one uh, was in different console. And so I guess this is my last point. Um, can you use both ROS1 and ROS2? And the answer is yes. And this is particularly nice, which means that you can still use all the legacy systems that were written on ROS1 uh, while you're porting them to ROS2. For example, if you have maybe some kind of uh, complex system, maybe a robot that is doing some autonomous mission, you probably have a bunch of different modules, like maybe control, maybe planning, uh, maybe mapping as well. And let's say now you want to add your great uh, tracking, object tracking module, uh, but you want to write this in ROS2 because ROS1 is getting used less and less, but you have a problem that all of the other software stack like planning and mapping and control, everything is written in ROS1. Um, so you can still start developing your tracking module in ROS2, and then you can just run ROS1, ROS2 bridge, which will basically allow your tracking module to maybe track some objects and then inform your controller, which is still running on ROS1, uh, what maybe the location of those objects um, are. And then eventually this, why should you care about this? Simply because it buys you time kind of to port all your old legacy code um, to ROS2. Or if you don't want to do that, you can also uh, leave it um, just on ROS1. So here is now we will try to run the ROS bridge, um, which then let's try to do this again. Um, okay. So what we're gonna need, oops. Okay, so here in this in this terminal, I will just do ROS2 run, and then I will run a demo node, which will be the oops, CPP, and then we can say the talker. So now we just have one node publishing this string. And then in another terminal, what we have to do is we have to source ROS1 workspace, where we can just do source ROS, and then we can do noetic, uh, and then we can just say setup.bash. So we first source ROS1, and you will be much more successful if you type the command correctly. And what we do then is we source ROS2, ROS, so this would be foxy setup.bash. Uh, and now what we have to do is export ROS master URI. So this is just like a resource identifier, which will generate environment variable. And it tells, it tells the system where the ROS master is running. And we need to have this such that ROS2 knows which ROS1 master to talk to simply because ROS1 still uses this kind of master follower architecture. And then you let your 
bridge just run um, in the background. So, so this is the command that will just export um, the roast master. And now we can try to run the ROS1 bridge. So you do this, it's simply uh, just another, it's just simply just another ROS2 node. And then again, you do ROS2 run, uh, name of the package and name of the node. So now it's complaining because I don't have the ROS, uh, I don't have the ROS, ROS master one running which I will just do here in different terminal. So I need to source, uh, source of the ROS, no, I tick, right? Uh, setup dot bash. And then hopefully type this correctly. Okay, so now we can here run ROS core. Note that I did not source my ROS2. Um, I did not source ROS2 in this terminal. And now I can split this. And so here now I can run my uh, ROS bridge, which is now telling me that there's basically one message and this is just the log message that is being passed. And now here uh, I can run again ROS1. And what I will do is I will just run the listener node, which then hopefully in this terminal, if all of this works, I will get this string here as an output. So now we can do ROS run, ROS CPP tutorials, and we can run the listener node, right? Yes. Okay. So you can see now that basically ROS, ROS1, ROS2 bridge is now telling me, okay, I'm, I'm kind of routing your chatter topic through the bridge. I'm passing message of this type. And then now you can see that uh, basically here on ROS1 side, which are these two terminals on the right hand side, you can see that the message is coming through and that this listener node is indeed hearing uh, what the talker said. So if I kill this guy now here, you can see that uh, things have stopped here. You can also do it the other way around. So you could also publish here and listen here. This Ross bridge does not care uh, which way the communication is going. Okay. So this was the ROS bridge, and here is just summary of ROS2 versus ROS1, where we have seen that we use different communication in the background. So no more TCP IP. ROS2 uses DDS, which internally relies on UDP protocol. You, had, you saw that ROS1 relies on ROS master and ROS core, whereas ROS2 is really truly distributed, and we could just run nodes and they would discover themselves in the background on their own. Uh, ROS2 only, sorry, ROS1 only works Ubuntu, whereas ROS2 has also support uh, for more operating systems. Also the changes, the language standard has changed. So we have bumped our C++ and Python versions to 11 and Python 3. Uh, ROS2 also provide, provides an option to use other build system. So here we use Colcon build simply because this was in the tutorials, but you could also use something else. And then there's here just some minor details which we did not talk about, um, but basically ROS2 is also a bit more optimized for uh, in the way you can deploy your code, which you can do more granularly, which for us is not that important, but for industry, uh, this is quite important. Uh, and then I guess the biggest difference um, that will concern us is that launch files are no longer in XML, but they're now written in Python. 
uh, and basically you have finer control over uh, how stuff is executed. So this brings me to the end of this presentation. And then if you look through the slides, at the bottom of the slides, we've put resources for you where you can then follow the tutorials and try to reproduce some of this stuff on your own. And we have also put here like a brief summary of ROS2 resources together with our own ROS2 package template, which is on our GitHub. Uh, however, this package template is still a work in progress because our lab has not switched uh, to ROS2 yet. Are there any questions related to ROS2? If not, you're free to go uh, and work on your exercise with the TAs. Okay, I assume there's no questions. So I will then end this lecture and thanks everyone for attending.